Hello and welcome to Scotland United, a roundup of what's been happening at the Scottish FA. Not much doubt about the main event in recent weeks, but there's been plenty going on besides. In the course of the next 20 minutes, we're going to be hearing from Head of Coach Education Donald Park, Megan Snedden of the Scotland women's team and the Chief Executive of the Scottish FA, Stuart Regan. Winning in Wales looked a distinct possibility for Scotland when James Morrison made the breakthrough. The lead should have been 2-0, but a shocking decision ruled out the goal, which would surely have sealed victory. Gareth Bale scored twice, and Craig Levine's team left Cardiff pointless. Getting anything in Brussels against multi-talented Belgium was always going to be a long shot. Two goals in the last 20 minutes settled that one, and from our first four group games, Scotland had picked up only two points. It was the end for the manager. Stuart, you must have built up a pretty close relationship with Craig Levine over the last few years. Um, was it a painful decision to have to tell him that that was it? Yeah, it was really hard, actually. Craig and I had a, a great working relationship. Um, we used to speak on a regular basis. Um, and to have to give him the decision that we'd relieved him of his duties was, was really sad, really d disappointing personally and, and also for, for the association that we were part in company. Tell me about the process that was gone through um, to end Craig's relationship with the SFA. Well, we sat down after the Belgium game um, as a board and we decided that you know, we needed really to give Craig the opportunity to go away, relax, um, have some time uh, on holiday and then meet with Campbell, the president, and myself uh, when he got back from holiday. So we did that. Uh, we, we met with Craig on the, the Tuesday after he returned from holiday. Um, we spent an, a good hour or so just going through the campaign, getting his thoughts and feelings. Um, and then we fed those into a board meeting, uh, which took place on the Thursday. Um, the board raised a lot of issues. Um, asked lots of questions as you would expect and further information was then uh, sought over the weekend. Um, I was tasked with, with providing that and we then had a further board meeting on the Monday um, at which point the decision was made that we would uh, relieve Craig of his duties. I must stress we didn't terminate Craig's contract. Um, we agreed to, to honour that contract. We'd entered into a legally binding uh, document and we felt that we were duty bound to honour that. There's been a lot of criticism about the time taken uh, to relieve Craig Levine of his duties. It was nearly three weeks I think between the, the defeat in Belgium and the announcement being made. Well I think you know people can can look uh, at the process that we went through and pass comment about it. However our next qualification match isn't until March next year. Um, we'd got a relationship with Craig uh, and to be fair a lot of progress had been made particularly in terms of the number of players uh, that he brought into the squad, the quality of those players, more players playing at the highest level than we've had for uh, for some time if, if ever and the board weren't uh, as one in terms of deciding what what was the right decision it needed a lot of debate it needed a lot of discussion um, and you know that's why we decided to take our time with it you know we gave Craig the opportunity to go away after the second double header uh, to be fair to him he'd had a tough time uh, we felt it was impor important for him to relax and when he came back we sat down with him and we started going through the campaign in, in more detail. Um, when all of the facts were outlined and when we'd put everything on the table in front of the board, um, the board uh, reached a, a collective decision that you know, it was right for, for Craig to, um, to be relieved of his duties. Are you happy with the way it was all communicated to Craig at the time there was, there was talk of him being involved in a conference call? Um, I'm more than happy with the, the process. Craig was actually invited in to come to Hampden Park uh, on the Monday when the decision was made, um, but he preferred not to, to do that. He preferred to join by, by telephone call, um, as uh, some of the, the other board members had chosen to do. So it was, um, it was handled uh, in a professional way. Uh, I personally spoke to Craig on a number of occasions throughout the process, and as I said, Campbell and I met with him uh, after his return from holiday, so you know, I'm more than happy that we've we've tried to manage it in as 
professional a way as possible and you know it's it's never easy uh, having to discuss somebody's f you know future uh, with them but you know we we did everything that we could is it frustrating to have to start all over again with a new Scotland manager um, I think it's it's challenging uh, as a board you know we're we're waiting for the the next campaign match in in March and we know that we need to have a plan and we need to get to a, an appointment as quickly as we can however what we won't do is be rushed into making an appointment simply because there is a desire for a new Scotland manager it's important that we recruit the right person for the job and we need to decide as a board who that will be so we're off to the Luxembourg game this week um, when we come back from that match we'll be sitting down as a board and looking at the plan uh, for, for appointing the next Scotland manager uh, and deciding how we go about it. Did the voice of the public play a part in the decision making process to relieve Craig Levine of his duties in that if the Scotland fans lose faith in the manager they're not going to be turning up for games? I think you know the fan view is is a key view uh, in any decision, um, but clearly it wasn't the the only factor. There were a number of considerations uh, the board took into account in relieving Craig of his duties. I think the the first one, uh, the overwhelming one, was the the performances in the first four games. Uh, Scotland being bottom of the group with only two points out of a possible twelve, and being eight points behind the leaders was really a position that the board were, were very uncomfortab uncomfortable with. Uh, I said at the time that you know, the, uh, the feeling was Scotland were not bottom of the group material. Uh, we've got to be better than that given the quality of players in the squad. And the feeling of the board was that we needed to bring a new manager in to, to lift the team and to, to galvanise the performances to try and get more points. I think secondly, uh, Craig indicated uh, to Campbell and I that it was his intention to step down at the end of the World Cup campaign in any case irrespective of um, the outcome and the feeling of the board was you know why wait uh, why wait until that situation why not give a, a new manager every opportunity to come in now and try and restore some degree of respectability to the current qualifying campaign um, and then look to build for France 2016 for the Euro Championships when, as you know, there are 24 places up for grabs um, for the first time ever and Scotland are clearly hoping to grab one of them. Is the search for a new manager a headhunting process or do you uh, draw up a short list and have a series of interviews? I think um, that will be part of the, the process that the board go through after the Luxembourg match, deciding which route we want to go down. As you've said, we could target our preferred candidate and headhunt that candidate or we could have a, um, uh, a normal application process and decide to interview a short list of candidates. Um, at this moment in time we, we're not, uh, we're not uh, wedded to either one of those options so we'll be making that decision next week. Are you conscious of the fact that the fans probably want an appointment made yesterday um, against the fact that after Luxembourg, the, there's not an, an international for quite a while. Yeah, there's always a clamour for for information and action, and I think you know the uh, one of the downsides of football is that everything is played out in the in the media uh, all the time. There's a thirst and a hunger for information and a desire for action. I think it's important to understand that you know we want to make sure we get the right person. Um, we are very, very comfortable in Billy Stark as an interim manager. He's done a great job with the under-21s. He knows a lot of the players who have come through into the squad um, and we're more than uh, confident that Billy uh, is a, uh, a safe pair of hands for the, for the foreseeable future. Um, and clearly when we get to uh, finding out who is the right person for the job, um, then the board can take the appropriate decision. Former Scotland defender Davy Weir was guest of honour at the Bank of Scotland Midnight League Player of the Year Day. It's a scheme which attracts thousands of youngsters to more than a hundred venues. I think grassroots football is always important, you know, I think it's a it's a starting point for everyone and you know it kind of puts the enjoyment back in football for everyone. I think, you know, when you're involved at the other end and the serious end where it's you know it's all about results and it's it's all you know, very business-like and professional. It's nice to see the grassroots side of it and see smiles on kids' faces and see kids kicking the ball about and 
and remembering where it all started. Do you go to Bank of Scotland Midnight Leagues quite regularly? Uh, yeah, I go often, uh, every night on a Friday from 6 to 8 and it's, uh, it's, it's quite good, get a good game of football going and yeah, it's good to go out and make friends. Jim took us a tour through the tunnel um, on the AstroTurf and we got medals and David Weir came and we got a training session and a couple of games. I think the values remain the same, you know, you, you try to preach to them the the sort of the same things as you preach to your own kids and kids that you you know that come up through it to be honest and to be hard working and to try and be the best they can be. You know, there's no shortcuts and there's no secret sort of ingredient that you can give them. You've just got to do the work and spend the time and to remember what you're there for, you know, because you you love football, which we all do and you know, that's the thing you've got to remember. It was here at Hamden that the Scotland women's team played the first leg of their Euro 2013 playoff against Spain. That one ended all square. The second leg was in Madrid and that decider had an agonising ending. Megan, I'm sensing you're still suffering a bit of pain, are you? Yeah, definitely. Just, um, I think it's going to take me a while to go over this one. I actually only started getting over the Russia defeat four years ago, maybe the last couple of months. So... Really, it's taken that long? <laughs> Yeah, well, I wasn't as bad about it, but it, it, yeah, every so often it pops into my mind and it hurts. So I thought, finally got over that one. And I was sure we were going to qualify for, well, this round, but we never made it. I don't even know what to say, I'm just devastated, to be honest. Is that part of the problem, that you, you all believed so much that, that this was actually going to happen? Yeah, I think that was the biggest problem. Like, we get such a, like, a great side, a lot of quality players, really young team as well. And I was just, just, I was so sure that we were actually going to make it this time. And the rest of the girls felt the exact same. We all really believed. And I think that's the hardest thing to take. Really disappointed, but... We're at Hamden. How was the, the first leg? Did you feel as if you'd done enough? Well, to be honest, it's always difficult. You're playing in front of your home crowd and that, and you really, you want to come away with something out of the game. And I know it's not the best result ever, you'd, you'd rather have a win, but the fact that we've got a draw, that still keeps us in the tie. And the girls like knew what to expect, because we'd never played Spain before, well, most days anyway. It's been such a long time since I think that, they, that Scotland played them, I can't even remember when it was they played. But I wasn't around for that time, so at least we knew what to expect next time round. And were you able to enjoy the, the special experience of playing here, playing at the National Stadium? Yeah. Um, that, well, for me personally, it meant a lot. I've dreamed of that as a kid. I never honestly thought I'd get the opportunity to play here. So, yeah, I was delighted with it. That, like, the, the, even the day before, we trained in the park. And it just meant so much. And then to play in, a, in front of your, your mum, your dad and friends and everyone else, it's just unbelievable. And even after 1-1, you still thought it was very much doable in Madrid? Yeah, definitely. I was, I was slightly disappointed that we never won. I was certain that we could take them, but I thought we could. I thought we would go through. I really believed it. Tell me about for you how that second leg unfolded. Well, when we went one 0 up, then I was I was delighted. They brought it back. I still thought we would win. And then when it's went any extra time, you're thinking, oh god, get another half hour of play here. Then we've scored, and I just thought, that's it, we've done it, we're through. They've got to score too now to, to actually go through. Other than that, we, we were kind of happy sitting in Sweden 2013, to be honest, and I honestly believe that was it. And then when they've scored, I still thought, they're not going to score another goal. To score two within that short space of time, it's, very unlikely. Then when they got the penalty, that was the only time I had the slightest wee doubt in my head. Gemma pulled off a great save, unbelievable. I thought that's it, this, this, this is fate, we're going through this, this means we're going through. And then just, just things went on, just dying seconds, just horrible feeling. It actually still hurts me to talk about it and think about it. There's not really a, a more painful way to lose than that, I suppose, is there? No, I think that's the hardest or like way to go out and probably the worst I've felt. But even like Russia, that hurt me a lot and 
this game doesn't this it doesn't even come close. Like the Russia game doesn't come, come close to this game at all. And you seem nowhere near to, to getting over the disappointment. No, not at all. I'm still still break down in that and still getting upset over it. Just I don't even know how to put it in the words, but Can you not look at the big picture and think that, that the team has done really well to get that far and maybe look ahead to qualifying for the World Cup mm. in Canada? Um, at this moment in time, no. <laughs> I, I do think the team's the team's been great, done absolutely brilliant. But I still believe we should have been there. That's what's hurting. We should have been there, and I believe that we are better than Spain, and we deserve to be there. That's just my honest opinion. Scotland's under 19s are an impressive step closer to their European Championship finals. They topped their qualifying group and reached the elite round of the competition by winning all three of their group games. The under-19 women's team is also through to the European Championship elite round. They won two of their three qualifiers in Turkey. The Scottish FA has a big reputation for coaching coaches. There are some well-known faces here at the Inverclyde Sports Centre in Largs in pursuit of the qualifications they need to go further in the game. Well, I want you to say, will start out wherever you want, Sebi. Gav, you'll go and play for there. Anyone from the middle can go in and anyone from there can go in. All right? So, Paul, how was that? How did you feel that went? Yeah, I think it went OK. I got some good criticism for Jim afterwards. Uh, plenty to scrub up on, that's for sure, but I enjoyed it. What was the main focus for you? What was you? What were you concentrating yeah, on? Yeah, I was defending as a team from the front. Uh, that's what I was trying to do. Uh, the boys done excellent for me as well, which which always helps. Well, how would you describe the quality of coach education that you get here? Excellent. I mean, this is obviously our, our UEFA A now. Uh, I've been through my B here as well, and yesterday we were treated to Alex McLeish and Peter Grant gave us a bit of master class and how it should be done. So uh, it's been excellent to be fair. So what stage are you at now? Uh, this is our UEFA A, so this is uh, part of it, it's a year long course, so this is just, we went in in June to start it, and then obviously we're, we're in a couple of times throughout the year, and then our assessment comes in, in June next year. And these are qualifications you have to have, don't you, if you, if you want to, to move ahead in the game? Yeah, yeah, it's part and parcel of the game now, you have to have your, your B and your A and be seen to progress as much as you can, obviously the pro is the next big one, so uh, I'll try and do my best on me and hopefully get to that level at some stage. Do you feel pressure? Uh, a little nervous. I mean, you, you're you're dealing with good football players and great experience in the game, so you, you still feel the nervousness, definitely. Yes, come off it then, Dad. Well done, Danny. Well done, Gav. Good. Go on, Danny, press it. Is the Scottish FA's coach education still as highly regarded as it's always been? Well, I, d I don't know uh, on that side. Um, I certainly hope so. Um, on that side, we get a lot of. People speaking very, very positive things about our coach head and um, we just need to keep making sure that we keep our standards up as much as we can and keep evolving our courses at every point that we possibly can. Because it's always had a, an international reputation, hasn't it? Yeah, we've been very fortunate with the guys that have come here before. You know, we had Jose many, many years ago. He, he came for the B and we've had Vias Boss and things like that, that that give it a bit of credibility because of what they've done in the course. And we get a lot of applicants coming from abroad wanting to come on the course. But our courses predominantly, we want it to be for, for Scottish courses, you know, on that side. But the international flavour gives it an edge for us. Is there a pressure at the moment to, to fall into line with what UEFA are asking you to do? No, well, it's not a pressure on that side. We have changed the coach education structure, um, where before we had the four or the three separate channels, the adults, the youth and the children. And it's obviously the youth and the adult pathway has sort of come together because we want to get our youth licence accredited for UEFA so it becomes an elite A youth licence for UEFA. And we needed to do that on that side. And they seem very positive so far, but we've not had the result of that as of yet. Once you've got your licence, that's not it, is it? Because you have to keep keep on topping up the qualification. Yep, no, no, our, our CPD, our, our Continuous Professional Development, uh, again, it's it's UEFA driven. Uh, and what they're saying is, and they're right, you know, on that side, that you've got to do a minimum of 15 hours over a three-year period to keep your licence alive. And that would be various things where it becomes educational, not just... Uh, shall we say to do with the job that you actually do but actually going and learning different techniques or even sports science or psychology or there's various other ways you can actually do it but all we want to do is people keeping up to date 
we see it as very, very important because if we don't have good coaches, we won't have good players, and if we don't have good players, we won't have good coaches. So it's a, it's a catch-22 for us. We need to make sure that we are right at the cutting edge of the game so that we're actually keeping our, our coaches up to date on every aspect possible.